Hello and welcome to Glasgow Doors Open Day's Digital Festival. This event will begin soon, but first we have a brief housekeeping message. So that you can get the most out of this session, we'd like to point out a few features of Zoom. By clicking on the buttons at the bottom of the Zoom window, you will be able to access the chat room, and if you are in a webinar, you will also be able to make use of the Q&A function. The Q&A function is so that you can ask specific questions of the speaker, which they will be able to answer time allowing at the end of the session. Use the chat room to contribute more generally to the discussion or to share links and resources. When using these features, please mind your P's and Q's. Both will be monitored and recorded. Most sessions will be recorded and uploaded to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival YouTube channel and website. If you're in a meeting, please make sure you keep your microphone on mute unless otherwise directed by the host. If for some reason the session ends unexpectedly or you lose connection, please just click the link again and wait to be let back in. Similarly, if the host loses connection, please bear with us. We will do our best to manage any connection issues as and when they occur and may contact you by email if necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear about your experience of our digital festival. Fill out our survey to be in with a chance of winning a prize. Our survey is available at www.glasgowdoorsopendaysfestival.org.uk forward slash survey. We hope you enjoy this event. Hello and welcome to uh, Behind the Scenes at Glasgow Museums Resource Centre, part of the Glasgow Doors Open Digital Festival. Um, uh, many of you might know me already. My name is Ralph and I have the great privilege to be curator of European Arms and Armour at Glasgow Museums. Now today I want to talk to you about the wonderful collections uh, of the city of Glasgow. And you won't have to look at my ugly mug for the whole time because I have a slideshow. If you bear with me, we'll load it up. Just one second. Just going to stop sharing for a moment just to see what's happening. There we are. Apologies for the delay. There we go. Now I'm sharing the screen again. Right, that should be loading up as I speak. Um, I always say that uh, that my any technology before about 1725, I'm able to help with. Anything after that, I'm not so good at. So. Um, a very warm welcome, um, I'll just introduce myself. I want to talk to you today about 
the amazing collections uh, that, that uh, I have the privilege to curate. The collections uh, at Glasgow Museums belong to the people of the city. It's one of the wonderful things about this collection. And who, um, two figures that you see here are, are two of the reasons why Glasgow has such fantastic um, arms and armor collections. The gentleman sitting down with the cigarette uh, and his wee dog scapegoat is a chap called R.L. Scott. Um, R.L. Scott was the chairman of a Greenock shipbuilding firm. And he collected um, arms and armor. He was fascinated by arms and armor. He was fascinated by fencing and um, hunting. And he wanted to collect and uh, make a collection that would give an instructive survey of the development of arms and armor. And he bequeathed this to the people of the city. In the background, you can see his crossbow breakfast room. Um, and one of the styles of his collection is the Avant armor. You can see that, um, you can see that shiny steel, um, amazing 15th century harness uh, on display at Kelvin Grove. The other gentleman you see very dapper is a chap called Charles Edward Whitelaw, one of the earliest uh, scholars of Scottish arms and armor. Um, and we'll come across, he gave half his collection to the National um, Museum through in Edinburgh and the other half to Glasgow. Now, as with, um, as with all museum collections, what you see on display is only the tip of the iceberg. And at Glasgow Museums Resource Centre, it's a wonderful resource where hopefully soon um, visitors and anyone who's interested can find out more about the collections that are on display. And I've chosen this to, to kick off with because this is absolutely fantastic. Um, mail was a very, um, it's a very flexible, very effective defence. Um, is used, has been used and continues to be used. Anyone who feeds sharks will tell you how effective it is. Um, small links that are riveted together. You can actually see the rivets on this close up here. Um, protect the body, it's very flexible. Um, it would be worn above, it would be borne above a, um, a padded uh, defense called an Akaton. But this is a fantastic example, um, 14th century, possibly made in Germany, possibly made in Italy. There were great centers of manufacture um, in both these, uh, both these lands in the Middle Ages, and they exported their wares all across, uh, all across Europe. Um, and you find people in wills and such like, we'll talk about their fine habergen of Milan. Now, habergen is the, the word for a, a, a male shirt in this period. I won't go into the boring, uh, the boring etymology. But it's a fantastic uh, example. It's got this lovely decorated edge using copper alloy. Um, yeah, fantastic defense. Um, I've chosen this one as something as a bit of a, a bit of an oddity. Um, this is what is known as a combination weapon. Uh, it's made in, in somewhere in the German speaking lands in the early 16th century. Um, and it looks just like an axe, but if you look much more closely, it's actually combined with a wheel lock firearm. So that is the, um, that is the mechanism, that is the barrel, and that's the trigger there. Um, very strange, these combination weapons. There's different theories as to what they're for. Some suggest um, hunting weapons. Uh, one of my personal favorite theories is that uh, these are made by craftsmen as sort of oddities, but also to show off the skills of what they're able to do. The, um, the tempering of the steel and the springs, for example, the beautiful bone inlay. Um, they're kind of, they're oddities, but I think they're very much for showing off. So um, yeah, arms and armor can be weird and, and wonderful in different ways. Um, R.L. Scott, the other thing he collected when he wasn't collecting arms and armor, the physical arms and armor, was books and manuscripts about arms and armor. Um, he wrote a letter saying that nothing good had come up in the market except the inevitable books, damn them. So he was obviously get, getting frustrated, but his, his um, library of over 300 books and manuscripts contain some of the earliest printed books on swordsmanship. This one is remarkable. Um, this one dates to the 1530s. 
and it's by a, a, a fight master, a chap called Gregor Erhardt, who was not only a master, but has written this manuscript in his own hand and done these wonderful drawings. And um, in these, these Fecht books, these fight books, you'll see the different guards that are used. Um, you often get the master, here he is with his beard, training the apprentice, the younger man. And one of the wonderful things about Glasgow's collection is many of our inquirers, our visitors, are, are people who are relearning these, uh, these ancient uh, medieval and Renaissance mas martial arts. So to, to handle an object, to, to feel a weapon from that time, but to meet the people who, are, who today are, are relearning these things is, is a fantastic um, it's a fantastic way of bringing objects to life, I think, to, to see living history in, in practice. Um, next, R.L. Scott Library also has beautiful um, printed books. This is German um, from the 16th century. And a lot of the, the arms and armor collection is for killing and maiming humans. Um, a lot of it is for killing and maiming animals. They're amazing hunting collections. But um, these two objects are to do with purely showing off. What's going on here is a joust. You can see that both riders have collided and they've broken their lances and they've both unhorsed each other. And this horse has even been uh, knocked right over. I always feel sorry for the horses. Um, there's no barrier between them. And this is why the horses have been blindfolded and these bells round next to their ears so no one can um, so you can you can make them run at each other so jousting tournaments um, a way of showing off using specialist equipment that is not used for the battlefield it's only used um, for these celebratory um, jousts and tournaments this absolutely fantastic helmet you can see on the uh, on my right hand side here um, there's all sorts of reasons why this is special. Um, it is for jousting. You can see that there are no perforations on this side of the helmet. This is because this would be the direction that the lance would be coming in. For jousting, um, the, the highest sort of points that you can get, you get, uh, you get most marks for hitting the, the torso but um, the top marks you get are for striking the head. This is with a solid wooden lance. So this helmet, everything about it offers protection to the wielder, to the jouster. You can see how the shape of it will guide away lances, stop them from catching in it. And one of the other reasons this is very special is it comes from the armory at Greenwich. This was made about 1600. Um, the Royal Armoury at Greenwich was set up by Henry VIII to make armours just for him and for, for his courtiers. He brought in skilled craftsmen, the Almains, um, German speakers from uh, all over Europe to make armour just for him and for his courtiers. And, and the Greenwich armour's got a very distinctive style. I could go on ad nauseum about, uh, about the shape of the, the helmet and such like, but I know um, from having worked in the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Um, the Greenwich Armouries are some of the finest English armours ever made. And I know uh, there are people who would chew off their the right arm to have, to have, a, to have a piece of armour like this back in, back in England. I mentioned horses. It's not just, um, not just men who fight in battle, horses themselves as well. This is a, a horse's head defence known as a chaffron. Now, chaffrons, as you can see, are shaped to the horse's head, not only protection for the ears, but also protection um, from the shape to guide away blades, crossbow bolts, and such like. Um, this one's from the early 16th century, and it has a, a type of decoration known as fluting. Now, fluting involves hammering very carefully hammering these ridges. And either side of each ridge is an incised line. And what this does is it creates this fantastic um, decoration. And the decoration is reflecting the civilian fashions that are being worn at this time, known as puffed and slashed. So if you think of 
portraits of Henry VIII, where he wears these great doublets with the with all the with all the little gaps and the the silk poking through. This is um, this is recreating the civilian fashions. It's of a type known as Maximilian, um, associated with the reign of Emperor Maximilian I. And this wonderful um, printed book is also associated with Emperor Maximilian. These are knights who are going into joust. Um, they have all the finery. I think it's one of the things that's very important when you're looking at arms and armor. Often what you're looking at are the bare bones, the steel. You've got to think of padding, of decoration of the silks, the satins. We know, for example, from documentary sources that there were French dukes who had the insides of their armor lined with black satin. Now, not only would this look quite, uh, quite dapper, but it would also prevent the armor from catching. It would slide smoothly over the body and also silently as well. And there's an expert um, Spanish jouster from the 16th century, and he says that um, that it tarnishes the jouster's image if his armor clangs like kettles every time he moves. So even the way the armor moves and sounds is important. So often when you're looking at an armor in a case or in the store, you're really looking at the bare bones. You're looking at just part, the tip of the iceberg of what makes a, a spectacular armor. But this chaffron, very fine example of the Maximilian style. Um, one of the other things that um, the R.L. Scott and Charles Edward Whitelaw um, were interested in was firearms as well. Now, Scotland and firearms go back a very long way indeed. Um, some of the earliest anti-firearms legislation was brought in Scotland in 1567 by James VI. Uh, James VI had been held at gunpoint many times, um, he'd been abducted. He was also held at gunpoint when he was still in his mother's womb when, uh, when during the murder of David Rizzio. So a man who, was, who understood how dangerous these objects were. This is nice as well. This is the um, Borough Records of Stirling um, from 1549. And it talks about um, a man who's injured by the shooting of his pistolate. Uh, this is the earliest example of the word pistol in any of the languages that make up uh, the family of languages that make up English. Um, so that's quite interesting as well, that link between. Now, this is a fantastic object. Um, I love this for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it's meant to have been found in the River Kelvin in the 1870s. And it's a, it's a pistol or a dag. This is another name for, um, for a, a handgun of this type from the style made around somewhere between 1620 and 1640. Um, but what's very interesting to me, not only has this been found or said to have been found in Glasgow, it has this maker's mark, these initials, IC. Um, I is usually used for um, the Latin Johannes for John. Now, there are two John Curries, father and son, working in Glasgow later in the 17th and early 18th century. And their mark is very, very similar. So this might be John Curry, the grandfather. So it might be three generations of um, gun makers, dag makers who've been working in Glasgow. So if that is the case, this makes it the only Glasgow made pistol um, from this time, um, the third Glasgow made pistol in existence um from from this time and later and it's something quite remarkable about it now there are more elegant and more beautifully decorated um scottish pistols and and guns in general in glasgow's collection but what i really like about this is it's it's not the prettiest it's a little bit rough and ready um the decoration is not quite as fine um, but they're also, the, the craft that goes into these is very clever. The, the lock, the ignition system involves springs, um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of clever things. This cock here, for example, there's a little heel and there's a little catch that goes through that. Um, Scottish pistols are always, 
almost always made entirely from metal and they're not made from solid metal. These um, copper alloy parts, these uh, what is what is pretty much brass, um, are made in sections and then are brazed together. So these are actually hollow sections that have been put together in this wonderful um, this wonderful um, butt with this distinctive shape. So there's a lot of craft that goes into making an object like this, and it's really you know, the men who, who bore them at the time, we know that, um, that drovers from the Highlands, for example, would buy Scottish weapons in um, towns like Doon and Stirling, um, where other, where other um, quality makers were working. And this very long section here is a belt hook. So the, the, this is a left-hand pistol. You'd buy a pair you see that the lock is, if you were to hold it, the lock is on the other side. The right hand would have the lock on. Sorry, I'm doing a Simon Says thing with my fingers, <laughs> which you can't see. But basically, imagine you're holding two guns. That would be on the outside on your left hand. This would be on the outside on the other hand. Um, so you buy them as a pair and this long belt hook, you would have them seen about your person. You know, this decoration or one for legal legal purposes, uh, James the the sixth had bought in a, a death penalty for for carrying concealed firearms, but also very much to be seen. So pieces of pieces of decoration, um, way of showing off your your status. So early firearms and Scottish weapons are something that are, that are very fascinating to to me, and and hopefully to to people around the world as well. I know. For example, um, many North Americans and Americans are interested. The first shot of the War of Independence is meant to have been shot from a, a Scottish pistol from a Scottish officer. And the answering shot is meant to have come from a Scottish pistol from another Scottish officer on the other side. So it ties in with, with ideas of identity, which I think is fascinating. What I'd say as well is when you're looking at arms and armor, When you're looking at arms and armor, um, it's often a, what we call a, an empty shell or a lifeless, a lifeless piece of metal that, that it's thinking about the people who bore these weapons, who also who made them, but who bore them. I think to me it is a way of bringing them to life or, or even bringing them to death. This painting here in Glasgow's collection um, is a Victorian imagining of one of the most famous medieval battles, one of the best documented medieval battles, the Battle of Otterburn in 1388, um, fought in Northumberland between uh, a Scots, Scottish army and an English army. Now, the man who describes it, a chronicler, Jean Froissart, he, um, he spent time in the pub buying drinks from men from both sides. So his, um, his description of this battle, although very very sort of bombastic and, and, and chivalric, trying to, trying to tap into the, the readers of his time. It's also very well informed. And what's going on here as well is that the man who's painted this knows that the descendants of these men who fought in battle are still alive today. But what I'd say, one of the things I've been finding fa fascinating working on the redisplay of the Borough Collection, for example, which has amazing stained glass and other objects that have heraldry. Heraldry are signs and symbols. So for example, this man here, um, this is the Earl of Douglas, who's been, that's the Douglas coat of arms there. He's been mortally wounded. Um, although the, um, although the, uh, the Scots win the battle in the end, he's mortally wounded uh, and is dead by morning. So you can see him dying there as the sun comes up, but he's surrounded by men um, who are important to winning the battle. So this chap is, um, is Sir John Maxwell. And we know today, for example, Maxwell Park and the Sterling Maxwells who owned um, Pollock House have this distinctive saltire, this black saltire coat of arms. And um, Maxwell captures one of the English uh, commanders, Sir Ralph Percy, or Sir Rafe Percy, who you can see, um, and his Rafe's elder brother, Harry, Harry Hotspur. So you can see them being led away. And um, when, when, the, uh, when the Earl finds out that, uh, 
that Maxwell has has captured this important uh, fighter. He says, "Well, hast thou won thy spurs, Maxwell?" So, you know, he's he's proved himself as a knight. So, you know, everyone. What I'd say is is look around you. Look around the city. There are links between people, the medieval past, the people who bore these weapons. You can see that the that the um, the artist has tried to recreate these bassinets, these distinctive medieval helmets. This is a this is one from from a German castle. It's about 1350. But they tried to recreate the other the other man um, who's important here is the man on a horse. Now you can see these three fleur de lis and these little rings. Now this is um, this is bear with me. This is Sir John Montgomery. And Montgomery um, has captured, he captures um, Hotspur, Harry Hotspur, the elder brother um, and English commander. And with the money, with the massive ransom he gets, because the, the two lads are the, the sons of the Earl of Northumberland, and he pays so much in ransoms to get his, to get his sons back that the story goes, and there's no reason why not, is that um, Montgomery builds a castle at Paul Noon. Paul Noon is just outside Eaglesham. Now the castle is now a ruin. I've, I've still to have a look at it myself, like many of the castles close to Glasgow. But this shield here, this stone shield at the Cross Keys, what was the Cross Keys Inn in Eaglesham, this is meant to have come from the castle and there's no reason why not. It's of the right shape um, for a shield from this period. So that link between between the, the medieval past and also, of course, the Earls of Eglinton today. So the painter at the time, he would have known, you know, these men are important. I want people to know who they are because they're the ancestors of, of important men. So what I'd say to you is that, that arms and armor and the story of the men and the people who used and made them is everywhere, is all round about us. And all you need to do is, is look around and you'll start to see those links between things like heraldry, things like castles, buildings. Um, yeah, what I'd say is it, it's it's there round about us as well as as well as being being shut shut in in cases or a, a, an open access store like Glasgow Museums Resource Centre. Um, find out more as well. You can find out a lot more about. Um, Glasgow's collection. We're, we're beavering away, getting as much information as we can onto our onto our database. But what I'd say is, um, you know, find out more. These are your collections, the people of the city, and there's absolutely fabulous things in there. And also um, through this, you can even heaven for friend, you can even contact a, a curator if you need to know more. So what I'd say is is get involved maybe some time before we can get in store and, and handle these objects with cotton gloves for, for ourselves. But that, that time will come again. Um, but in the meantime, you know, find ways of getting involved. And what I'd say is, you know, uh, you need your museums and museums need you, you know, get involved in any way you can. There are ways to support, you know, museums that you're close to, local museums. They really, museums, and the people who who they belong to really really need each other. So what I'd say is is get involved. So that's I could blather on endlessly about uh, about arms and armor till I'm blue in the face. But what I want to do is I want to leave something to to be able to to ask. Uh, and answer questions that people might have about our collection. Now, my colleague Emily Malcolm is is on hand um, to field any questions that that you've been typing in. Um, she's giving an excellent talk this time tomorrow on the ship models in Glasgow Museum's collection. So um, get yourself booked in for that now. Um, I think it's going to be a great uh, it's going to be a great talk. So. Emily should be able to. Yes, um, Ralph, I've got a question here that's saying, um, do, do the pieces in Glasgow Museum's collection, mm -hmm. do you see the type of damage that is caused by conflict and warfare? Because the ones that you showed looked quite, yeah. looked quite um, pure and polished and perfect. 
how how does that do, do you have pieces which do show damage yeah that's that's a really good question um you know, I often say to visitors you know these these objects you're looking at these objects you held there's no reason why they haven't um taken life uh, or badly and i always describe swords for example as a very carefully designed tool for killing and maiming humans in the right hands it can it can lop off uh, it can lop off any any um, major major limb and it would be something you train from a young age. Yes, um, more photography is definitely needs to be done of our collections, but there are many sword blades with very serious nicks in the metal, which could be almost certainly caused by contact with other blades or with uh, bone or cartilage, for example. So, you know, when you look at an object, it might look quite decorative, it might look quite fragile, but actually they're made from very good quality steel um, and in the right hands, absolutely lethal. So, yeah, I mean, that's something to think about. It's something that, that is hard to, you know, shouldn't. Yeah. You know, should and be then there. there's a follow-up question to that, yeah. really, from, from, from Peter Munro. Mm -hmm. um, how effective was armour against cannon <laughs> fire? Um, and do you have examples of that kind of damage? Yeah. You know, I know that that's, that's something that you've... You that's, got a, that's a really good one. There's, um, this is something I've, I've often been fascinated about. I wrote a very dull article year, years ago about um, armour. Um, arm, it's a continuous struggle between armour and weapons. By, the early, uh, by 1378, so there are records of uh, crossbow bolts that are used for proofing armour at short range. Things like the Vaunt armour that you can see on display at Kelvin Grove, parts of that armour are four millimetres thick. And there's, um, there's a, a fight master, one of these experts um, based in Milan, although he's probably um, a Spaniard, a chap called Pietro Monte. And he writes, he's writing in the 1450s, 1460s. And he says that the, you know, there's good iron and steel, but the best is to be had in Innsbruck where, they, where the masters, they test their, they test their um, breastplates with, uh, with crossbows and also with... Um, with a, a handheld cannon, which we call a, a, a sclopet. So there's very early evidence for, for proofing against firearms. Firearms become more and more effective. And what happens is armor starts to change. Um, I've got a colleague at the armories who loves 17th century armor. I, I, find it, I find it a bit rough and ready because it's quickly made. It's made of softer iron. And the idea is it's meant to be more um, to absorb rather than to, um, to guide away. There's also a brilliant letter um, from 1590. It's the, the master of the Greenwich Armouries. And he says that, that he's heard of some, some metal which, which is grown in England. I love this idea of, of metal growing in the ground. And he has the, the armourers at the, at the um, armouries make a breastplate, one of hungry iron, one of good quality steel from, from the Alps, which is still, still produces the best... Um, ores for steel and he says he took a he took a, a pistol and with each uh, paste powder and bullet and he shoots each um breastplate at close range and he says basically what he's saying is it dents off the the good quality uh the good quality german steel but he says he can he can put his finger right through the hole and he goes this much for the english metal so it, it's a constant battle between but what happens is firearms become cheaper they become easier to train people to use and it gets to the point where there's no, you know, there's no real point in, in weighing yourself down further and further. But um, things like the cuirassiers at Waterloo, the um, the lifeguards um, the, that, that today wear these shining breastplates, they took those from the dead at Waterloo uh, and bore them. So it's very much a sign. Um, and you get you get ones that have meant to have had cannonballs through them. I'm not I'm not always a hundred can hundred percent convinced by these. Um, it's often it's often a nice tale to do with an armor, but what I'd say is it's a kind of it's a constant it's a constant battle between the technologies how to defend the body um, against and also mobility. You know, if you start wearing heavier and heavier armor, it gets to the point where it's like why bother? You know, it's it's weighing weighing you down too much, and that's what happens with the the heavier. You know, some of these 17th century breastplates. And helmets not only do they look really ugly but they they start to get quite quite bulky quite chunky 
but that's a really good question yeah mm. and to, just to follow up on that I mean but when they were testing this armor I presume that was just the armor itself they didn't have some poor volunteer inside the armor did they? <laughs> yeah, I love that idea that's great um I, I wish I wish we knew more about how this testing took place I mean what what happens there are there are regulations in France from the 1450s and it says that if you test it with a um, the armor with a, a bow or a crossbow it gets one mark if you test it with a a, a Kranikin drawn crossbow that's a crossbow that's so powerful I should also say there are some wonderful crossbows in, in Glasgow's collection uh, one that's so powerful you need a, a device to to span it to prepare it it gets two marks so the, the problem is once an armor has been tested the the, the Bishop of Toul and 1454 pays um, his crossbow and to break a few bolts off his off his uh, off his armor. Um, obviously, a, a cautious bishop. But what would happen, of course, is you want your armor to be shiny and beautiful. So once you'd seen the the dents for yourself, you'd have your armor come along and polish them out. So, um, but the Avant armor, we, we we have had it off display and we've had expert scholars look at it, and it has some very very crossbow like. Um, dents in it the problem with damage to an object is it, it can happen at any point it's very hard to say this damage was definitely done at that point you've got to be very very i mean i'm always very cynical when i look at an object i think well why 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 should i believe this is real why should i believe that this happened at that time and you've got to assess the evidence but um, but yeah no I, I like that idea i think if uh, if i was going to get something tested I would, I would definitely get someone behind it but as far as we know um it would probably be placed against something maybe uh maybe the butts that we use for archery uh, but that's a very good well, it's nice. It's nice to have that thought in mind, isn't it? Um, the other question is: it's about the actual building up of the collection. Um, mm. How were R. L. Scott and White Law? How were they collecting their pieces? Were they coming? Were they? How were they acquiring them in the first they, place? R. L. Scott was. He he'd become. He was immensely wealthy from the from the ship the shipyards, the hard work of the, the people who'd been working in the shipyards is one of the reasons he wanted to give back to the people of, of the city and, and the area who'd worked so hard. But he had a series of agents. For example, he bought the Avant armor, which is the oldest near complete plate armor in existence. He bought that from William Randolph Hearst. Um, Hearst had bought armor from across Europe. I mean, of course, in the 20th century, um, um, you know, Europe was a was a place of conflict. There were there were noble families who who were selling off, um, selling off the family jewels, as it were. Um, R. L. Scott bought the Von Tama from from the Von Trapp family in the South Tyrol, uh, the singing Von Trapps, and um, R. L. Scott's agent stepped in because, of course, like all empires, um, Randolph Hearst's empire crumbled, and he had to sell everything he bought, um, and and. Randolph Hearst's agent had said, uh, a specialist had said, you know, whatever you do, do not sell that armor. You know, they knew how important it was. R.L. Scott was very canny. He made a, he, he managed to buy the armor for 7,000 um, pounds in 1938. It had been valued at 20,000 um, pounds. So people at the time knew how important it was. So wealth contacts, R.L. Scott had very, um, this wonderful story about when he bought the Avant armor and finally, he had this this wonderful house at, at, at Greenock, where he kept all his trophies and arms and armor. It talks about he and Sir James Mann, who was master of the Tower of the Tower of London Armories, sitting together. Um, said the three of us sitting together to celebrate. But um, he he was in. There's wonderful. There are postcards, um, Christmas cards from people like Archibald Corbell, who was a great a fencer, a world a champion fencer and collector of books as well. So he he had a network of experts if he didn't know himself um, and he was always keen to learn he would ask someone he would you know he'd write to people he had this network of agents of specialists and and you can yeah it's quite it's quite nice that the core so you're kind of the sort of net there was a network of interest yeah. around at the time yeah and there's, yeah. there's two there's two further questions which yeah. i think you may have slightly covered it's they're both to do with money um, and you sort of covered about how much you know, those pieces were going for yeah. in, is that in the 1910, the sort of early 20th yeah, century. Yeah. 
Um, but um, someone's asking, how much did the armour cost? At, at the time, at the time. Um, and that's, are there any letters or invoices detailing those costs? That's a really good. Um, that's a really good question. It's something that comes up again and again. There are there are accounts. Um, there's a, there's a quite a famous one. It's an English knight in 1441, and he's buying um, Milanese armor. Milan, the Milanese and the, uh, were producing some of the best. Um, they'd mastered the art of heat treating steel. I think. So they made really good armor in 1441, and he'd spent uh, £7 for himself, but he'd also got ones for £5 for his squires. Um, to me, it's, it's kind of how long is a piece of string? If this is the, if this, if these are the weapons and protection that your life depends on, it's not the kind of thing you're going to scrimp on. It's the kind of thing you're going to invest in. So people with more money, buy more expensive armor. The other thing as well is it, it not only protects you, I mentioned um, there's a French Duke, um, Duke Charles of Orléans, and he was pulled out from a massive pile of corpses um, after the Battle of Agincourt. Now, people knew that this man was worth keeping because he had very shiny armor, but it was lined with black satin. So, you know, he, he spent the rest, most of his life in, in England writing uh, English poetry. But, but it's not just the quality of the steel it's also, it shows how important you are. You know, who's the man with the shining armor with silver and gold decoration? He's obviously worth a lot of money. So yes, there are, there are also bargain basement. There are, there are cheap armors and there are carracks, the massive ships that, um, that uh, merchants are landing at Sandwich in the 1460s during the Wars of the Roses. And you can get, you know, they've got um, breastplates and backplates for three pound a pop, you know, really cheap stuff. Um, that's being shipped in. So it's kind of it's kind of how long is a piece of string? How much money are you prepared to spend? Look, what that's the thing? same with most things today, isn't it? That you yeah. you buy you, you buy what you can afford and what Very you much. what you need. And I, I, as you say, preserving yeah. your life is quite an essential. Um, so another question, just. I presume today that some of these pieces of armor are very valuable, <laughs> and. Um, I know that in museums we don't tend to talk about financial yeah. value. We value them for different reasons. But someone's yeah. asked, what amount of money do some of these pieces go for <laughs> to collectors today? Is there still an active market in yeah. collecting arms and armour? What I would say is that there are people who are very interested. Um, the quality of what's able to be collected has, has decreased a great deal over the years, Scott. Uh, and, and it's like we're buying armour at a time when when the sort of fascination for it was really was really starting to to blossom, um, what what's very important is um, is that R. L. Scott bequeathed his collection to the people of the city in his will. Now, in Scott's law, that's legally binding. So nothing that R. L. Scott has given to the people of the city can ever be sold, because that's that's bound in law. Um, what I'd say is. The, the cultural value is is so much more than than the economic value. It's very much what someone's willing, prepared to pay on that day. Um, but you know, have a look at some auction catalogues. You know, you'll get an idea of of, <laughs> of what people are what people are interested in, what they're willing to spend. But I think what what's most important is these these things belong to to us and and are not there to be bought and sold. Yes, they would be. You know, <laughs> I know people who would remortgage castles to uh, to purchase some of the wonderful things that that are in the the collection of the people of the city, but but they simply can't. And I think the richest the, 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 the richness there. comes from the the additional material, doesn't yeah. it, Ralph? That yeah. that you know, from a non technical colleague of yours, armor is like is sort of a European icon, isn't it? But then yeah. so many of us just don't really understand exactly what its function is. It's a sort of shorthand to something, but it's that wealth of material that comes yeah. along with. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, you're right. And it's the people behind it. You know, we know, we know, and we're finding out a lot more about, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is the people who make armor, for example, we, we know a lot less about them because they're not as important or they don't there's so many sources as, as the men who and women who who wore armor i'm still trying mm. to find out more about joan of arcs <laughs> I, I, I found the armorer who 
uh, provided her with armor, but don't know, we don't know his name. But right. there's, there's so much more I'll say about armor, and there's so much there, more there to find out um, mm. about, and that, that increases the, the cultural value as well. You know, the more you know about something, the more you can put it in a context. I think, I think yeah. that's where there's, the value lies. There's, 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 I know that we're probably, we're sort of getting a little short of time now, but there's, there's a question yeah. that maybe takes us to the end of the story, really. Um, yeah. A question from David saying um, that, that he understands that most people are interested in the earliest piece of armour find, but when mm. did they stop producing armour and what's the most recent piece of armour in the collection? <laughs> I was going to say they're still making armour today. There are lots of skilled armourers out there. Uh, it's not cheap, but uh, there's lots to be had. Um, what what I would say is is there are what we call vestiges. There's um there's there's uh, and they're still worn today. There's a, an officer's. Um, it's a kind of it's basically I'm doing the Simon Says thing. Sorry, it's basically a moon shaped collar, often made of brass, called a gorget, and that's that's kind of the vestige of the the knight in shining armor. Um, also things like officers' swords, you know, an officer still wears a sword at his hip. The sword is a sign of um, responsibility and of status. Um, in, in France, for example, uh, in the Ancien Regime, you're either a noblesse de robe, a, a noble of the robe, or a noblesse d'épée, a noble of the sword, you know, the really, the, 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 the men and women who were the, the really old Guard. So yes, yeah, so what I'd say is, is arms and armor kind of it kind of exists in vestiges. You know, bearing a sword is about and in knighthood today, and knight knights are still made uh, by the monarch using using a sword. Um, there's a story about the House of Commons. I don't know if it's true that there's a pink ribbon in the changing rooms for gentlemen to hang their swords up, but I think it's it might be one of these tall tales. But it, it shows the it, it shows the. Um, the symbolism. What I'd say is it survives in symbolism. Um, you know, look at uh, war memorials, for example. You, in Scotland, you see a very distinctive, there's a terribly dull article uh, I wrote about Scottish swords, but there's very distinctive um, shape of Scottish sword. And you'll see this again uh, on war memorials, for example. So arms and armor, is, it's kind of there in different places. Yeah, we've got officers' swords, gorgets, um, but but they're kind of vestiges of, of a past of, of ideas of identity uh, and of status and of responsibility. You know, a, a knight of the realm um, swears to, to protect the weak and uphold the law. You know, they, they, these, are, these are qualities that are still expected uh, of people. So, yeah, I'd say it's, Arms Armour hasn't gone away. It's still there, but it's, yes, it's there yes. in different ways. Um, and then just... The, the, I think you've maybe covered this, um, but it's a question about um, is the armour worn by soldiers or is it mainly officers that would wear armour? And I think that's possibly drawing the distinction between, I've just asked the, 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 the questioner just to clarify if they're meaning a particular period, um, yeah. but, but so is it for the common soldier or for the, yeah. the well, officer? Okay. Well, I could start off with the, with the Middle Ages. In Scotland in 1388, Robert Bruce brought in a, an arming act, an act of parliament. Um, anyone with £10 worth of property or land had to provide themselves with um, an akaton, a padded doublet, a helmet, a spear and a sword. Um, and anyone who owned a cow had to provide a bow. Um, men or boys between 16 and 60 had to turn out for 40 days service a year. I don't know if they've ever taken this off the books. I'd be interested to know. Uh, and there are subsequent arming acts from 1425, 1495. Um, so, yes, basically you had to turn out with what you could. The other thing is these are just the minimum of what you would expect it to have. If you could afford more, I mean... I think there would have been a lot of sort of swapping, looting from battlefields. This helmet's a bit too big for me. I'll sell it on to you. I'll swap you that smaller helmet for this helmet. You know, I think there would have been a lot of upcycling and recycling. But it's um, but but what what um, what specialists call munitions armor, the sort of bog standard stuff. Very little of that survives, um, especially from the medieval period. Often, what you're looking at are some of the some of the best quality stuff. So I'd always say it's the tip of the iceberg, but Again, it's, it's by what you can afford. Um, one of the ways you can become very wealthy is capturing someone in battle, ransoming them. Then you've got lots of money to buy 
armor for you and your had also gifts as well someone like edward the black prince uh, who was seven when he had his first armor made we know from documents who fought his first battle when he just turned 16. Um, his register his uh, documents loads and loads uh, the men who probably saved his life in battle his household like loads of gifts loads of gifts of swords armor so get in with someone important get in with someone rich and you might get a, you might get a nice gift as well so yeah I'd, I'd say it's I'm afraid you never get a straight answer from the curator sorry um but I'd say is if you can afford it go for it find ways of of getting and the other thing that can happen there's a a, a lovely document it's a it's an English knight is it 1303 and he pawns his armor to an Italian bank in Newcastle and he tries to get the money back in the in their branch in Dublin so you can you can actually use armor to to pawn to see you through lean uh, to see you through lean times till you can afford to buy it back again uh, oh, redeem it um we've had another question coming in saying um what is the most common cold weapon in early mid medieval age in Scotland and that's from German I'd say I say the the the, the spear. If we're talking about steel, you know, use of of iron and steel. Um, actually, no, not uh, the bow. I would say uh, the bow. Um, the various Scottish kings tried to ban football, tried to ban golf, to get um, people to practice with the bow. And the the reason why Scots were so good with the bow. Um, because they were up against one of the most technically um, proficient um, forces in medieval Europe, the English, the English and their famous longbow. Um, the, the French brought in armies from Scotland in the Hundred Years' War, probably about 15,000 men and boys, um, two thirds of which were, were um, archers. And there's a, there's a chronicler who's, who's maybe about 17 or 18, and he's at one of these battles between the English and the Scots. He said, he said to see them, the archers, it was cruelly murderous that they would kill anyone they got a shot at. And what, what he's describing here is, is sharpshooting. You know, this idea of, of an arrow shower of loosing into the sky. You know, that's not the case. They're shooting each other in the face, in the throat, in the chest, because mm -hmm. they practice at the butts every Sunday and they can land an arrow. And there are lots and lots of people who lose eyes. There's a Scottish knight who loses one eye in one battle and one testicle in, in another battle. So I'd say I'd say the bow, um, and even the things about the you know about the two fingers. There is a there is a French chronicler who says that the that the you know the Scots uh, taught the French that if when you capture an archer, either put out his eye or cut off his hand. You know they 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 knew. I will say that that. That um, bows don't kill people, Englishmen do. But I could probably say Scot Scots do as well. Um, but the, the sad thing is, there are no medieval um, long bows remaining. The earliest we have is um, bows from the Mary Rose that sunk in 1545. But the draw weights of these bows are, are incredible. Um, but you would start when you were a child, and you know, by the time you're a teenager, you might end up fighting in France. You might capture someone very valuable and you might be able to build a castle. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say bows. You've come full circle then. Um, I think that's that's the end of the questions, unless think, any yeah, of yeah. The, um, the attendees have a last minute question. So I think we're, we're due to finish at four o'clock, aren't we? Yes, we need to finish bang on time, don't we? And um, what I'd say is, you know, um, anyone who's interested, you know, do get in touch, you know, through our, through our, um, through our website. You know, I'm always happy to talk uh, to talk arms and armor, talk to on blue in the face. Um, you know, find out more about about your collections. You know, and, and that's one of the wonderful things about my job is that I'm here to to help people find out find out more and tell me. You know, I'm always I'm always learning. I'm always finding out more things. So you know, I, I learn when people ask me things as well. Um, so I suppose we should draw it to a close. I, I just want to thank uh, thanks Emily for for emceeing. And thanks to Stephen Chair from the, the Glasgow Doors Open team for, for having me and um, for having this wonderful festival. And um, hopefully that's given you a little insight to behind the scenes at Glasgow Museums and Glasgow Museums Resource Centre. Thank you very much.